Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, I didn't want to, we got a lot to get through today, so I didn't want to spend too much time waiting for the attendees. We got about 20 so far, and I know folks are rolling in, finding links and stuff, so we're just going to get to it. So welcome. This is the first panel of the Putting in Work series put on by Unity Charity. Uh, the idea behind this panel series is to support entry-level and emerging hip-hop artists to find ways uh, to excel and really understand how they can be successful in this post-COVID world where everything is online. Uh, my name is Rebecca Harrison. Uh, I'm the executive director at Unity Charity. Uh, Unity is a national nonprofit organization. Uh, we use hip-hop art forms to help young people develop experience. Uh, so we got programs all across the country. We got partners, friends, community artists all across the country. So I'm um, really hoping that some of our friends from the Winnipeg are out today, hoping that we got some folks from Halifax, maybe some cats from BC, Saskatoon, uh, joining us from all over. Um, I want to welcome all of the panelists who are here today, star-studded cast. Um, I'm going to get to the more uh, detailed uh, introductions with everybody that we have online today uh, a little bit later in the panel, um, but just wanted to say what's up to everybody here. Um, as well, of course, hello. Hey, from Winnipeg. I see a hello from Winnipeg. Yes, we're national today. <laughs> um, I want to welcome all of the participants. Um, as I mentioned, we got folks from across the country. Also super dope. We got all kinds of different hip hop artists with us today. So we got MCs, we got beatboxers, spoken word poets, you got breakers, street dancers, probably some graph writers in here, probably some producers and songwriters as well. Um, love that kind of community cross-genre, cross-discipline space. Um, I also want to encourage folks, because we have such an awesome group of people here today, panelists and attendees included, don't be shy in the chat, eh? Like, use this as network here, shameless self-promotion is encouraged. Throw a link to your newest piece up. Let's check it out. Let's support one another. Give us your socials. Follow each other. You know what I mean? Like, we're here tonight. As I mentioned earlier, there's, at last check, there were 73 people registered for the panel. So there's enough people doing crazy art from Canada today. Uh, so share, follow. Let's, uh, let's spread some love. Um, just a couple housekeeping pieces before we jump into things. Uh, first, uh, for folks with diverse abilities, um, we are going to have recordings available of this session with closed captioning uh, so folks can listen, folks can watch. And yes, that means that for everybody else, uh, the number one question for all panels is, is there going to be a recording available? Yes, there will be. You can share it with your friends. Um, a couple of other things. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is the first panel in a series of four, right? And we've got multiple disciplines online with us today. Uh, so any questions that folks have that get super specific to your discipline, we might not get to your questions today, but make sure you tune into the other panels because they are discipline specific. Um, in addition, other sort of questions and learning pieces here, uh, we have the awesome uh, Maddie Lee online with us today. She's a Unity Charity host. If anybody's having any major technological difficulties, you can send uh, a message to the panelists and Maddie will see and help you out if she can. Uh, as well to facilitate everybody's learning, uh, as our awesome panelists are making recommendations, whether it's to links uh, or pages, pieces of equipment, whatever, uh, Maddie is gonna be going online to pull up links to things that our panelists are making reference to. So you can line up your tabs of things to research uh, after the fact. Uh, thank you in advance, Maddie. We really appreciate you. Um, as well, uh, I know everybody sees our chat function, but there is a question and answer function at the bottom. We've got an incredible group of people here to answer your questions and to share their insights. So don't be shy about asking your questions. Yes, Q&A. Um, put them into the q and I'm going to be picking them out at the end and we're going to allocate at least 15 minutes to questions. Um, so it's as if you know, it's as if you have these folks in your living room, you may as well take advantage and ask the questions that you've always wanted to ask to Abby Alvino or Master T or anybody, you know, don't be shy. Um, there's also going to be a super quick evaluation at the end when you guys shut down uh, the Zoom link at the end of the meeting, it's going to take you right to a survey. I'm like, I'm all about criticism and feedback, you know, <laughs> it helps us to be better, it helps us to learn what you guys need, uh, how we can better serve. Uh, and support your development. So if you can take, you know, a minute to fill in the survey, that's much appreciated. Um, 
super important thank yous. Uh, first and foremost, I want to thank TD for supporting this panel. Um, this panel is a part of Unity's Artist Training and Development Program, uh, which is supported and sponsored by TD. Um, as a part of TD's goal to help people feel a sense of belonging in their communities, TD supports arts and cultural events, initiatives and organizations like Unity all across North America uh, that amplify diverse voices. That's what this panel is about. That's what Unity is all about. We want to make sure uh, that artists from all different backgrounds and all different genres have a chance to grow and shine. So thank you to TD for making this panel series possible and for being such incredible allies to Unity for the years uh, behind us and moving forward. Thank you. Um, also, big ups to Aura LLP. Andreas, appreciate you for co-presenting the panel today. Um, uh, Hope that Aura LLP are experts at developing creative solutions for clients. Andreas personally has worked with some really dope emerging hip hop artists in Toronto and from across Canada. Um, so if you're at a point in your career where you need some eyes on a contract, maybe you made a dope beat and somebody else is using it and it's blowing up and you want to protect your property, um, Aura LLP is a great place to go to get insight and support. You can check them out at Aura, A-U-R-A underscore L-L-P on Insta, that's the Insta handle. So thank you for co-presenting. Thank you for having us. Mm -hmm. um, okay, very important, before I do a more detailed intro for our panelists, um, I wanna do a couple of acknowledgements here. Uh, first, I'd like to acknowledge and express gratitude to be connecting with everybody on the panel today from land that is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples and is now home to many First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. We're going to take this a step farther, though. I'd also like to invite everybody to join me in taking pause to acknowledge the fact that the ability to connect with one another online is an immense privilege that is not equally afforded to households in Canada. There's a huge digital divide that has been highlighted and exacerbated since the onset of COVID-19 with everything moving online. Um, only 30% of Indigenous households on reserve have access to the internet as compared to 99% of households in urban centers. So in delivering these panels online, in learning about how to excel in the virtual space, we're all collectively contributing to the widening of the gap between artists and creatives who have access to the internet and those who don't. Um, so I wanna invite folks to think about what acts we can take to lessen this divide. Um, we can educate ourselves on the Canadian government's rural infrastructure commitments. We can use our voices and our votes to hold them accountable to their targets. We can use the influences and energies that we have available to us to support Indigenous artists, communities, and organizations in ways that model your activism and allyship in the promotion of equity and reconciliation. Um, in particular, if you do one thing, uh, I wanna invite you folks to share out an organization that's called Internet Society. You can see them at internetsociety.org. They're doing really amazing work. They're a nonprofit uh, working to ensure that every Canadian has access to the internet. One other important acknowledgement, um, as an organization that achieves impact through hip hop art forms, which are products of the black lived experience, we also wanna acknowledge the legacy of the black community and the founding and the propagation of these art forms. Um, another invitation to action. I want to invite folks to consider how we can collectively lend our energies to make sure that Black artists and communities benefit from the popularity in the widespread commercialization of hip hop culture and art forms. Um, we can hold the media and industry accountable for the uplifting and respect of hip hop art forms and culture, educating when we see them referred to with ignorance and stigma. Let's continue to promote the value and importance of hip hop as a space for communities to protest and resist the systems that cause and perpetuate their oppression. Let's remember to learn about the black roots of hip hop, pay homage to the OGs who came before us. And finally, as we all do in the community space, let's keep lifting as we climb and pave the way for black youth to thrive in the hip hop communities that we move in so that they can find resilience and pride within this culture that is a legacy of their heritage. Um, yeah, exactly. 
Yes. Um, okay, let's get to our panelists. I'm not gonna lie, you folks made my job difficult. I had to try and pare these down and it was a challenge. <laughs> um, you all have incredible bios and resumes of work here. Uh, so first I'd like to introduce the one and only Master T, Tony Young, decorated Much Music DJ, hosting and interviewing some of the most successful artists in the world, including Tupac, Jay-Z, Mary J. Blige, Eminem, and many more, I know, <laughs> and many more. Currently the director of media production at RX Music, who's also hosting their online series, which is Superfly, uh, RX Music Live. This is a series that brings a fresh perspective on the stories of some of today's greatest stars, including Sean Paul, Neon Dreams, and Vance Joy. Master T, welcome. It's a pleasure to have you here. I didn't get a Thank chance you. to speak to all the attendees, but I know the panelists were super psyched to be sharing. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Absolutely. Honestly, honestly, it's a real pleasure to be here. Crazy. And, uh, Rebecca, thank you for the invite. And um, yeah, for me, I'm here to learn. Trust me. So it's awesome. great. Yeah, hopefully we're all gonna, we can all learn here. Uh, Andreas Kalaginidis, our rep from Aura LLP, um, also uh, provides legal support to Unity. We appreciate that. Uh, Andreas is a business and entertainment lawyer. He represents some of Canada's leading creatives, creative businesses, and cultural institutions, including music producers, OVO, TDE, Travis Scott, artist managers, and creative agencies. He routinely prepares and negotiates agreements in music, film, TV, and book publishing. Andreas, we always seem to find ways to work together. So happy to have you here today. Thanks for thinking of me. It's great to be here. Absolutely. Okay, Abby Albino, especially Abby. Man, your bio, I had a hard time paring this one down. I, you have an incredible body of work. Um, Abby, beginning her career on the PR team at MLSE. Abby led the PR strategy for MLSE's core brands, Toronto Raptors, Toronto Maple Leafs, MLSC Launchpad, and others. Highlights include creating PR strategy for the 2016 NBA All-Star Weekend, the We the North campaign, as well as the partnership between Drake, OVO, and the Raptors. Currently working at Trevor Peter, Abby concentrates on community strategy for brands such as Nike Toronto, RBC X Music, Foot Locker Canada, and many more. Love this as well. As a proud child of Filipinx immigrants, Abby also co-founded Rise Tribe, a charity focused on empowering, empowering the next generation of Filipinx Canadian youth through leadership, education, and networking. Abby, welcome. It's such a joy to have you. Hey guys. Um, last was certainly not, oh, not last, not, not even last. <laughs> But not least either, <laughs> we've got Planet Mind. Planet Mind. Uh, he's created videos from such artists as Drake, The Weeknd, French Montana, ASAP Rocky, Belly, Cream, Rihanna, and many more. Specializing in music videos, tips artists, specializing in music videos. Planet is also part of numerous projects in film, television, and fashion as well as commercial projects for Mercedes-Benz, Louis Vuitton, Apple, Electric One Runway, and app company Off The Menu. Yes, correct, these panelists are crazy. <laughs> <Agreed>. <laughs> now, last but not least, Ricky Bexade, which I love the Bex in there. I love your last name. A Remix Round One alumnus. Ricky has held various positions at Remix and has directed the Recording Arts Program since 2017. In addition to his work at Remix, Ricky is part of Division's management team and has managed several large-scale world tours and music festivals. He's also the director of the OVO Summit, an annual conference for young Canadians, artists, and entrepreneurs. Wow. Wow, panelists. Amazing. Um, okay, that's the last, that's the, the welcomes, the intros, the acknowledgments. We, we've got through it all, and uh, and we're ready to get into the main the main panel content. Um, so I know we've got five people on online with us today speaking who come from really different backgrounds, different realms of experience. Um, so I think that it makes sense for us to start kind of with the big picture, if we can get a sense of kind of how the game has changed. This panel series of what's conceived of in response to COVID everything shifting online. I don't think anyone would disagree with the statement that COVID has really changed the game for the arts, creative, and cultural industries uh, in ways that are not 
solely short term. You know, we're seeing this movement kind of like an exodus, you know, from the venue to virtual. Um, and these are trends that are not necessarily going to disappear. You know, it's going to be a while before we can be in huge groups, but seeing what's possible in the online space, uh, we're definitely kind of in a new era now. Um, and the way that things have changed, uh, people need different skills. People are making money in different ways. Um, but what we really wanted to do here today and with this panel series in general um, is make sure that entry level and emerging artists who don't always have the benefit of being connected to industry folks get that connection. We want to help them understand how industry has changed and how that affects the pathways that are available to emerging and entry level artists who are trying to get to that pro space. So starting big picture. The first question today, we're going to put this to all of the panelists, is what is the most important COVID-related shift in the industries that you work in, and how does that shift affect entry-level and emerging artists who are trying to grow in their careers? Can I put it to Ricky first? Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, coming from a music standpoint, uh, from my vantage point, I'd say the biggest shift for us um, that I've seen is everything is now curated from first person or within the confines of your own home. Um, what took the biggest hit would be live touring, live performances, and what the cause and effect of that um, for emerging artists is we're all kind of back at the same level playing field where the content is accessible through the same outlets and avenues. You can't go to a live show no more. You can't wait for your favorite artist to show up in your city no more. You can't go support your local artists. It all takes place from um, at home, whether it's going on DSPs to listen, whether it's creating um, your own content and putting it out through your own platforms or finding cool ways of partnering with different platforms and different people to share the same message. So I think that's been the biggest shift through what we do is, um, we're all kind of taking a step back and creating and, and exporting and putting out content and music back to the roots, whether you have a large fan base or a small fan base, it's all being created and uh, put out from your living room um, and from intimate settings. That's such a dope perspective. And I love that because I feel like lots of artists, it's like, it's like that's it's so encouraging to think that it, this has actually leveled the playing field in some ways, you know, like, that's, that's a really encouraging perspective. Um, can I put it to, to Tony, Master T? What do you think? Most important COVID-related shift, and how does that shift affect artists at the entry level and emerging stages of their career? Um, well, I just, you know, kind of add to what Ricky was saying. I mean, for, for us at Arts Music, we were actually doing interviews at our offices uh, where we'd have the guests come in and do an interview with them, sit down and interview we'd have full uh, full band uh, performances um and then we edit it package it and then bounce it um you know through the various channels facebook you know instagram uh youtube uh now you know we've done probably close to 30 or i've done 30 uh 30 interviews online uh, which has, uh, which for me was, I'd never actually gone online and done Instagram live, you know, so I had to check in with my 16 year old first and, um, <laughs> and figure, figure the whole process out. And he's, he's actually my assistant. So I'm like, what happened here? <laughs> oh, dad, you went a little long. It was, it was longer than an hour. They cut us off. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, but scenario there. Yeah. So, uh, but you know, I think what it is, um, it's like what Ricky was saying, it is a level up um, playing field. I think, you know, the creative mind, this is, this is a time where you can be creative. You have the opportunity to really kind of understand who you are as a person and who you are uh, as an artist and really kind of look at, you know, the different avenues where, because a lot of these young cats are way more skilled than, you know, than, than a certain level of uh, different generations. Mm -hmm. um, so, it, you know, it is an opportunity for them to, you know, and it comes down to, you know, really, you know, the, the, the important thing is you, you have to have a, a level of talent, a mm -hmm. level of skill, um, but at the same time, you, you know, there are avenues now where you can, if you're creative enough and, you know, you can partner with other people, you know, to really get your, your yourself out there. This is, I, I think it's a, a, a really interesting time for uh, creativity. For sure. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I like what you said, adding to the starting this on a positive note, the saying that even at RX Music, you guys have done even more interviews than you normally would. There's more opportunities for artists to talk and share than there were before. I think that's that's a really interesting perspective. Yeah, and uh, sorry, sorry, just to add, sorry. And, and the record labels are understanding now that, you know, that this is a legitimate platform for mm -hmm. their for their artists. Um, so, you know, you, you know, Universal's on it, Sony's on it, um, you know, um, you know like a lot of uh, uh, independent uh, publicists are on it. So it's, it, it is important for them to, to, to choose different avenues um, for, for all these uh, social platforms. For sure. Plug for those of you who are in that art forum, we do have a rep from Sony coming on next week, next week's panel. So make sure if you haven't registered yet that you do. Um, can I throw it down to Abby? Biggest COVID related shift in the industries that you work in and the effect on entry level and emerging artists. Yeah, so I think my answer kind of, <clears throat> it relates to Master T's and Ricky's in the sense of creativity right now is king in the sense that <clears throat> brands, that I'm used to working with often do a lot of their activations and their, their brand things in physical spaces and environments. So we're inviting people into our spaces where we might be uh, either launching a new product and or with through, you know, community people. So we'll have artists doing murals and things like that. However, now those spaces don't exist. So a lot of our brands are going digital and by going digital, we're going to the people in the community who are the creatives. So, it's interesting that a lot of the creative our artists out there, like I have a friend who's an influ who's an influencer, mm -hmm. um, but she's a she's an artist. So she does photography, she does um, sculptures, she does murals. She's done way more in the last four months than she's done in the last year because brands are realizing that like they don't have a voice on their own. They have a voice through people, and the people are starting to uh, represent and align themselves to brands in that sense. Um, on the music standpoint, obviously, live is, is out the window and sports as well. Those are two my, my, my two worlds. Um, so from a live music perspective, it's interesting because to, Ricky, to Ricky's point, like there, there has been a, um, a bit of like a shift in, in the playing field has been leveled. But now we're seeing the people who don't have the resources, like producers and, and proper cameras, they're actually coming up with really dope stuff that like, they're they're coming it's more it's like more creative because they don't have the resources to really to provide them with everything else that everybody else has um a really interesting article that i read about arcade fire years ago was that they actually took away a lot of like their digital equipment and things that like allow them like a leg up and they just stripped everything and they're like how do we make really dope music with paper and whatever else like it was like really obscure stuff um, and they ended up making one of their, I can't remember what album it is, but they were like, we are the most proud of this album because we had limited resources and we created more out of it. I love that. I love that. And again, like this, I didn't even plug folks to say it like this, but the idea that like, you know, having varying levels of access to resources kind of like fans the flame of creativity and that that has just that that has just as good a chance to be noticed and recognized as someone who has all the resources in the world. I know for entry level and emerging artists, we're always trying to kind of do what we can with what we got between our other jobs and stuff. So that's the, really this is like such an uplifting way to start <laughs> to start this panel. Um, let me throw it down to Planet. Planet, what do you think? Um, so specifically about what we're doing right now. A very important thing is to remember that we are not at a level anymore where you can just be great at one or two things. You gotta be great, honestly, at like three to five things. And personally speaking, when you work on something, I was just talking to my, actually my friend's mom the other day who had a job for like 30 years. And she was even telling me like, you know, kids these days, they gotta learn how to essentially be great at multiple things. No one said you can't be great at multiple things. You can be trying to be great at too many things. But if you hone in on three to five things, the mind can do that, you know? And that's something that I strongly believe. For me as a filmmaker, designer, musician, um, I've definitely been on the computer way more. I've been having to remember to exercise more because I'm now inside working on my computer more. And that's very important for anyone who's stuck inside working on stuff. Just remember to get an hour of just like some sunshine, some even just sit, sit next to your plant, just something where it's like not 
technology to some, and then you can appreciate the technology out. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. So you would say in terms of just uh, my understanding of what you said, the idea of the shift is like previously we could be more concentrated and specific. Mm -hmm. and now we got to kind of, we got to resign ourselves. Exactly. To that, but there are other skills that we need. Okay. So. Right. Like focus on things that aren't just going out. What can you do while you're at home as well? Like in not, not just for now, but for later on in life too. All right. So yeah. thank you. Okay. Last but not least, Andreas important COVID related shift in your industry and how that affects artists at the entry level and emerging stages of their careers. I, th I think the other panelists have really nailed it where it's the COVID is the great reckoning. It's, it's leveled the playing field in terms of the amount of resources you have to do different things. And the end result is just a massive level of uncertainty in the market. And so I, I take that from what Abby was saying about brands and activations where I've got clients who would produce video content commercials or live content for say cannabis companies doing retail activations or uh, alcohol companies or retail companies, things like this. And they're, th you know, where they were previously very busy producing good content and making good money at it. Now those brands have entered this period of uncertainty because they don't know what their own budgets and their own priorities are and what that means I think is that there's this opportunity for people who maybe haven't had those kinds of uh, those entry points to get in there and pitch ideas that are low cost that are innovative that are creative where because that's what that's what brands now are looking for brands that might hire someone to do graffiti or to do dance or to do uh, like uh, some kind of a video themselves don't really know exactly what they're doing. So I think they're very open to hearing from absolutely anybody who has a good idea and you know, their budgets are lower. So if you can come in at a good price point, mm -hmm. I think it's, it's evening the playing field a lot. Awesome. Cool. Yeah, man. Wow. Like I said, what a great, a great positive way to start this like everybody had uh you know good news for what this means for the pathways that are available to entry and emerging artists we've got a leveling of the playing field more entry points you know everybody in the same everybody starting from the same the same line i think that's a really encouraging way to start and gives us like such a positive way of, of taking in that bigger picture and that covid has actually created more opportunities for entry and emerging artists. Awesome, thank you everyone. Um, in terms of going from big picture, I wanna kind of jump now and go to the technical. So kind of starting uh, at the most important basic considerations uh, when you're filming and shooting stuff from the comfort of your home, own home as everybody is doing right now. Um, so artists, uh, just get a sense of those folks in the room. Um, how many people have watched somebody else's live stream and thought any combination of like, damn, I wish my Wi-Fi was that strong. Damn, I wish I had natural light in my spot. Gosh, I wish that like I had a nicer backdrop to film from. Um, <laughs> I've talked to lots and lots of people who have said that watching other people's live streams is disheartening because they visibly have access to like better space, technology, whatever, than they do. Um, and I want to, I want to, I want to name that. I want to normalize that. Like there's all kinds of people who are facing barriers and don't have the same kinds. Yeah, it hurts, right? It hurts sometimes. Um, so the purpose of this section, I called it, I don't know if we have any Reddit fans, Rate My Setup is the name <laughs> of the section that we're going to get into here. Um, lots of folks are facing barriers to participating in the online space. So like what's to be done here? How can we look as pro as possible with the resources and the circumstances that we have available to us? So I'm going to shoot a couple of questions here to plan it specifically. Videographer, artist extraordinaire. Um, we're going to start, with, <laughs> start with, the, with really the technical setup here. So my question is this, Planet. If an artist had less than $100 to spend on, on, on technology, could be mm -hmm. mic, camera, cords, stands, whatever, mm -hmm. how would you recommend that they spend that money in order to improve the level of professionalism that they can achieve when participating in an online opportunity? 
All right, well, I'm going to start off by saying this. First of all, $100 is like salt. It's like peanuts in this day and age. However, I'm not going to say you can't do something with $100 because I've been told, and it blew my mind when someone told me this years ago, it's not resources, it's resourcefulness. And so I'm going to tell you right now. One more time. I, one more time. It's not resources, it's resourcefulness, you know? Love that. And I'm going to tell you, when I started making beats, like, I had a computer, right? Like, that's the first thing you got to ask yourself. Do you have a computer? That's right. probably one of the biggest things. If you don't have a computer, you can get a cheap phone um, because that has a mic, that has, you know, uh, it has a light built in, that has everything you need. If you're doing video. Now, if you're doing audio, uh, and also for the background, don't worry about the background. Like, I'm in working on stuff today, so, like, that's whatever. But usually a blank background, it's fine. It's all good. It's people are here for you, and that's, that should sell itself. And okay, wait, 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 when you say, because even that, even a blank background, like hmm. some folks, like artists are, you know, living with multiple generations, like right. for them to even get a room to themselves to work from for like mm -hmm. how many hours can be a challenge. So mm -hmm. you're saying that to try and find a space that has like neutral, better than busy. Yeah. Personally, when I watch someone on TV, I don't, I'm looking at what they're saying. I'm more interested in what they're saying. Um, I don't really care too much about what's in the background, but I get why people might feel like, oh, they have this and that makes them look better. Really, it's like, if that's the case, if you feel like that, just you got to work a little bit harder. Simple as that. You got to bring something else that, okay, say you don't have a piano in the background. What can you bring that will show someone that you are really truly making what you're making, you know? Right. And I always tell people when I was making beats, I was literally in the library on my laptop without a piano pressing the little on uh, sound editing programs like uh, Logic or these stuff programs. A piano is actually just a little keyboard. You're pressing the keyboard on the, on the actual uh, computer right, and right. it's emulating keys. And I was in the library, literally pressing little computer keys, getting sounds and making beats. So if you don't have a space, find a space. I know right now COVID, you can't really go out like that, but try to find a space where you're secluded and you can create something and just be with yourself. Okay, dope, dope. Um, uh, again, the tech question. So is there any kind of like, I mean, I swear to God, one time I saw an artist doing an interview and they had their phone and it slipped and it was like balancing on like some rolled up socks, like, <laughs> you know, and you're like, you gotta do what you gotta do. <laughs> you yeah, yeah. To struggle. But like, is there, is there anything like that in terms of like, you know, a, a brand or a stand or something mm. like, even like your angle's really nice right now, you know, like how do you- So uh, yeah, a monopod or something, just anything that can like, uh, okay, hundred dollars. Are you saying specifically what music or video or design? Like what's well, specifically? Let's say you're doing like a, like uh, what, whether it's something like this, like not necessarily mm. recording, but you're going to be, you're going to be, let's say it's a live, a live performance. And do you have a phone already or, or do you not yeah, have a phone? So you have a phone. Okay, so the great thing is um, I would recommend YouTube. YouTube is the greatest resource. Um, basically, if you type in tech under $100, tech under $50, top 10 tech, like the, uh, the world's an oyster. Um, that's how I personally, when I had no money to get into this stuff, that's what I did. I went on YouTube okay. and looked at a lot of deals and basically found things that were, you know, you can get like a temporary knockoff brand that'll last you a couple of years just to get your leg up until you can buy the real proper stuff, you know? Okay. Awesome. Um, keeping with this trend. Um, okay. I guess you said as far as visual aesthetic goes, don't stress too much about the background artists. Be confident in your content. Mm -hmm. That's what people are there to look for. I think that's a really encouraging uh, thing to say. Um, two other things as far as the aesthetic goes, like I mentioned, like angle, like if artists are working with like, what's an, uh, <laughs> what kind of angles how should they be trying to position their camera to capture them um eyes try to keep it with your eyes eye level eye level um chest up basically try to have try to face a window so windows are like there's a window near me so there's like a lot of light coming in and on top of that make sure that it's like the one third rule like i'm here this is one third that's one yeah. third yeah. that's one third you know what i'm saying so try, try all that stuff that helps Okay, so one third in the sense of like, okay, so this is my screen. I'm gonna try and occupy one third and have a nice third on either side of me as mm -hmm. being kind of visually pleasing. Yeah. yeah, totally. Now, if you're just in front of a camera, I would recommend that you just uh, make sure also have a, have a mic, very important. Okay. And just remember that whatever you're doing, even if you mess up, they don't know that you've messed up. You need to show the world that what you're presenting is completely on point. And mm -hmm. even if you feel like you're slipping up, be the person that you like think that you can be 
That's how I look at anything right now. I just want to be the person that I am. And I'm also the person that I'm striving for. And remember that just because you're at the spot you are now doesn't mean it's like that forever. You're going to amp up. You're going to get better. It just takes some time to practice. Mm -hmm. Facts. And coming back to like what you said, the resourcefulness over resources, like the mm -hmm. fact that you don't have expensive equipment or a nice setup doesn't mean that your art isn't super creative, doesn't mean that you cre can't create something cool looking with what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's really helpful, Planet. Thank you. Thank you. Um, folks, I'm going to remind, as a first reminder here, if you have questions specifically, if you want to know something from Planet about a tech setup, a piece of software, whatever, um, put it in the Q&A and we'll make sure that it gets to him at the end of the panel. Yeah, I'm a nerd with this stuff. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> dope, dope, dope. Um, okay, so we've got our setup. You got your lighting right. You got your angle right. You got the thirds. Um, let's talk a little bit about screen psychology. Um, I've heard from a lot of artists that it's been kind of a challenging transition, you know, going from having a crowd around you or in front of you uh, to going to a camera uh, is challenging on a lot of levels. Um, performing, battling, exhibiting, whatever it may be with a group where you can kind of feed on their energy and see their facial expressions and hear them calling out your hometown or your nickname or whatever kind of gives you that life and that energy and like performing to a, a camera like crickets, you know, um, and also media training, super expensive, like <laughs> not something that's easily accessible to a lot of people. Um, so I'm going to take a minute here and put a couple of questions, of course, to Master T. Um, uh, in terms of thinking about on-screen persona, in terms of thinking about banter and how people talk to a camera, can you share a few of the most important fundamentals of communicating and holding yourself on camera? Specifically, what are some of the pitfalls and what are some of the easy ways that people can, can look professional on camera? Uh, well, I think the you know, important thing is, is to, you know, easier said than done. I'm going to probably say this a couple of times, but you, you have to be yourself, you know, and, um, you know, so if you show up and, you know, um, you know, I mean, I'm Tony Young, which is much more chill than Master T. So I'm kind of like, you know, defeating what I'm talking about. Um, but uh, you, you really do have to, you, you can't just, you know, come on and jump up and, you know, kind of create this persona and, and it's just, it's just not working. Um, so a, a lot of times I think it's for a lot of young artists, you know, they, you know, they, they take and they, they grab from, from, you know, from, from people that they like or, you know, or, or an actor or an artist. Uh, so a lot of times it's, you know, it is challenging, but you kind of have to, as much as you develop your craft, you have to develop yourself. And you have to develop yourself in terms of being in front of, uh, you know, being in front of a camera. And if, you know, and in the beginning, you can be in front of, you know, people who are going to give you constructive criticism. You can be around family, you know, uh, you can be around people that can, you know, really honestly tell you. I mean, my wife tells me and she's told me from the day, <laughs> like, you know, even after I'll do an interview and I think, oh, it's great. She's going, what was all the ums, ums, you know, you know <laughs> sometimes you got to take a pause and, and, I, and I get really defensive. I'm like, well, but, you know, um, um, you know, um, um, but, you know, that's important because, you know, a lot of times I'm, you know, I'll go back out and then I'll, I'll think about it again. And, uh, you know, and I think, I think, I think that's important. It's important to really take that constructive criticism um, to, mm -hmm. to help you and, and to push you forward. Because as much as you can create beats and as much as you can, you know, you can be out there and you can be a great break dancer or you're a you know, spoken word artist, um, you are going to have to at some point hit a platform where you're going to have to talk about yourself and share who you are and share, what, share your craft honestly and openly. For sure. For sure. I think that's so true. And it's like, I'm sure that resonates with a lot of artists here who are not necessarily step into a mic is not necessarily a part of their art form. Um, and like you said, I, I really, really resonates with me, with me, the idea that be yourself sounds so easy. Know yourself sounds so easy. Um, but all of a sudden, you got a camera, you got people, you know, in front of you, it becomes a lot more, a lot more challenging. And it does take practice. Um, I feel like when I started at Unity Charity as ED, I wasn't accustomed to having to stand up and represent on behalf of the organization. Um, and people are like, just be yourself, just be yourself. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I don't normally have to be myself in front of a whole bunch of people, you know, <laughs> like I can just be myself in the corner or whatever. Um, I also really like what you said about taking constructive criticism. 
Yeah. You know, when we surround ourselves with people who we know believe in our craft and believe in us, I think that we can take their criticism as love and as fact that they're, you know, invested in us and supporting us, not trying to tear us down, right? When criticism comes from love, that's, that's respect. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, even, you know, I have a 16-year-old and a 23-year-old, and they'll say, Dad, you know, you can't wear that. You know, that's not you. You know, and I'm like, oh, well, I, I thought I was looking good. You know, like, Dad, like, you know, that's somebody, like, we would wear that, Dad. Come on. And it's like, you know, you know it's important. It's important for me to, to, to listen to them because they, they are out there. You know what I mean? And I'm also, I got to represent them as pops. Um, but, you know, it's, uh, yeah, definitely. You, you have to take the, you know, the constructive criticism, um, you know, where you can. And, and it can come from... You know, if anybody's willing to listen, I think that's one thing a lot of young cats sometimes have to take on the fact that, you know, and I, and I look at it as a generational divide at certain times because a lot of times they think, oh, you're older head and you don't know, you don't live in my world. But you will, you know, the, if you're recording, a recording artist from the 70s, there's still not a whole lot that has changed in the, in the 2000s mm -hmm. and uh, 2020. Mm -hmm. There really isn't in terms of the, the base form of, of an artist and what right. the artist is to, to present. Uh, you know, to to a platform of uh, a live audience or or a virtual audience. Yeah, that's, I'm okay. I have one more question for you. Um, uh, I've seen a lot of uh, you know, as we talked about, everything's moving online. There's actually more opportunities out there. People are searching for more and more ways to create content. There's so many more Q and As, live interviews, people just getting on camera and talking about whatever. Um, I wanted to ask you, as someone who has interviewed probably thousands of artists, um, can you tell us what makes an interview or a guest really stand out? And how can an artist prepare for an on-screen conversation or an interview? Well, I think for me, I, I still look for, I, I always try to go past uh, the bio interview. So, or the PR interview where, you know, you, you uh, were always given, you know, a bio and, um, you know, a, a, a publicist breakdown of who this artist is and everything. And so I always try to look, uh, look past that and, and really leave, I want the interview to be uh, be left with, hey, I, I kind of found something out about that person I didn't know, um, you know, and, and that person opened up and I, I found something, you know, about that person that I didn't know, you know previously. I think I just said that twice. But, you know, I, I think that's what's always important is to see and, and to try and touch and to, to try to uh, connect. I give you a good example was um, uh, I've interviewed Mary J. Blige. I've been fortunate enough to interview her numerous times. And, um, and in her early stages, she... Um, she had to go through a finishing school. Uh, and that's what a lot of major record labels did was they, they, they would hire some, you know, finishing school to, to put this little, you know, young kid through the fact that, hey, we want you to speak and, you know, and, you know, speak with good diction and, you know, and, and, and you know, sit upright and everything else. And, you know, what they didn't understand, what they were taking away from her, they were taking away her, uh, you know, her personality and, and who Mary J. Blige was. And one of the things is when I interviewed her, um, you know, I, I sat down with her and I said, man, I said, you know, like people are just giving you a hard time. And she just kind of did a, I said, you know, like they don't understand who you are. And she goes, you know, I just, I just wanted someone to, to say that to me. I just want someone to understand that about me because they were trying to mold her into something, you know, like to this day, Mary it will still be that, 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 that powerful uh, woman that she is because that's just exactly who she is. Um, so for uh, a lot of young, uh, a lot of young people and, uh, and emerging artists that are coming up, um, you know, to give them some, some ideas in terms of uh, tips, you know, you can, again, you can, you can try to do it online and you can, you know, you can, you know, do it in front of people. I actually went on YouTube, you know, good old YouTube. Thank you, Planet. Um, and there's uh, how to get comfortable on camera. And, you know, there's a little cheesy element to it, but it, it does, it does make sense in terms of what mm. this person is trying to say and, and, and give you pointers about how you can conduct yourself. And, you know, one of the most important things is to, is to be clean, is to look good and to, to present yourself in terms of, you know, your, your, your exterior, your clothes, your, your, your look and whatever your look is. 
like fixing up or like, oh, let me get back. Yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> and, um, and, you know, you're, you know, and it's about being honest and, you know, it, it's such a personal, it's a personal space. I mean, you can look at CNN, you can look at all of the, the media, TSN, all of them now. Well, the one thing I like to do is, is be in a lot of people's houses because on CNN, the, whoever, whichever doctor it is, you can see, oh man, look at those books or look, look what's behind them. They, they all have to open up and uh, give a part of their own personal uh, mm -hmm. self. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and um, so with that personal self, it, it's really, you know, come to the forefront. And a lot of emerging artists, I think that's what you have to look at. It doesn't really matter what's behind you, but it's really what you kind of, you, you're putting out. Um, sure. Nobody else can, nobody else can be you. Exactly. Nobody else exactly. can talk like you. Nobody's lived the life that you've lived. Nobody mm -hmm. has the insights that you have. And so again, I like this trend of like, confidence and what it is that you specifically bring to the table because right, nobody right. else can bring that right sorry i'm gonna give you one more thing and it and, and, and it takes work as much work as you put into your craft it mm. takes work to actually you know do that for yourself and, and to push yourself to put yourself forward it, it, it's not something that's going to happen overnight and you're yeah. going to trip you're going to fail you know i'll take you back quickly when i was a vj and i i was auditioning to be a vj i came up with this whole personality like hey what's going on hey what's happening what's happening hey, 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 hey. and my you know the editor who was a good friend and my wife said that's not you you know like who, who the heck is this and i gave it to moses Neimer, um and he was like looking at me like come on that's not the t i know and then then i had to kind of come and you know the fear of actually okay a little bit of tony coming out and that's what people fear sometimes is actually bringing themselves out and you have to do that for sure and that's kind of like that little bit of like that insight like you said that insight into you getting a little bit vulnerable letting people see yes. who you are and what you bring i think that's amazing yeah. thank you thank you thank, thank you thank you insights there um okay so now we got you got your lighting right you got your tech right you're not balancing your phone on your socks you look clean you got your confidence that you're bringing. Um, I want to take it now to a little bit more of a strategic uh, level. Um, and I know that there's someone in the room who knows, who loves acronyms. So I love this acronym. You always want to be SOL. You want to be strategizing, optimizing, and leveraging your opportunities. Um, so what I want to talk about a little bit here um, is helping artists to select opportunities that make strategic sense for where they're at and for their career goals. Um, how do artists create or select opportunities that are right for them? Um, I know, especially in this online space, we're all kind of looking side to side at who's doing what. Uh, for me anyway, anytime I see, I'm, I see, I'll see, see other nonprofits, for example, and I'll be like, oh my God, should we be doing that? Should we be doing that? Um, and lots of artists, I think, um, at least initially had this kind of like spray and pray approach where it's like, I'm just going to do anything and everything and hope that it creates traction and hope that somebody notices and that it moves me closer to where I want to be. Um, but I think there's also something to be said for being aware that we can do things that will damage our audience engagement, that are going to damage, um, you know, our reputation. Um, and so uh, what, the question that I want to put to the panelists in terms of this kind of strategy, goal-oriented question, um, it's a two-part question. So one piece of advice to help artists decide what kinds of opportunities are going to move them closer to their goals, and one piece of advice that should be a red flag, something that should make an artist walk away from an opportunity or decide not to do something. So I'm going to go the opposite direction. Can I put it to Andreas first? Sure, sure. So I think to answer your, your second question first, things that should be a red flag for you is definitely if you're not getting paid for something, you really, really got to reevaluate what it is that you're getting out of a value perspective. And I, I see this all the time. I see this with um, it, established artists who sometimes leave money on the table. I see it very often with emerging artists or artists who are on the come up where they don't recognize or they, they it's harder to see their own value and then maybe, maybe even more difficult to express that value in a way that makes sense. I mean, and I think that that's the number one red flag. If you're not going to get paid, you don't work, you can't work for free because you, you provide something of value, whoever you're contracting with, your fans, a brand, 
whoever is getting value and that's why they want you in the first place. So if you're not getting something that is fair and I'm not talking about a hundred dollars or 50 bucks or you know, nothing anybody in this room does is worth a hundred dollars. It's worth a lot more. So you really, that's a big, big red flag there. Sure. And in terms of, um, did you want to leave it at that or did you have kind of a piece of advice in terms of helping an artist to see a connection between their goal and an opportunity that's in front of them? I think, I think it kind of, the way I picture it is, is I take a step back from that. I think to, to evaluate an opportunity in light of where you want to be, you have to understand what your brand is and, and what your, your, what your, like what, what stories are you telling as an artist? What are you putting forward as your unique energy and values that differentiate you from everyone else in the market who does a similar thing to you? So right. I think, you know, that's, it's, you have to look at when you're evaluating an opportunity, what is, what is the, the impact on my brand? Am I, if, if by doing this, am I furthering my brand goals? Am I telling the stories that I want to tell? Mm -hmm. And then maybe that makes sense for you to pursue that opportunity or not. Awesome. That's great, Andreas. Thank you. Um, I'm going to flip it down to Abby. Abby, can you speak to that? Yeah. Um, I think, so it's interesting because I, I think I talk to a lot of artists like from all streams when I represent our brands because we work with a lot of art, artists. So creatives, like videographers, photographers, muralist dancers, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we often uh, partner or collaborate with these, with these people to, to um, tell a brand story. So back to brands as, uh, Andreas was saying, one piece of advice for furthering your career in this sense is think about what your brand is and align it to the brand that you want to work with. Think about that, like, because when we're looking from a brand perspective, I'm looking at the community and saying, does this person align with my brand? So, you know, I've been, I've been super lucky to have worked with several brands um, and that's always the question. The question is, if I look at your feed and I'm scrolling through, is there anything that like is a red flag for me as a brand that's going to be like, oh, like I want to work with this person, but maybe, maybe, maybe not, maybe not for this particular thing. And, and we always look for storytellers and people who are giving back. Like we're, I'm super community minded and I'm so it's like super glad that the brands I work with are community minded as well. So when we look at them, we're like, cool, great photographer, but there's a lot of great photographers out there. What are they doing? What else are they doing? Like, what is their story? Like, it's more about like the, not just the skill, it's about the person and it's about what they're doing for their community. That's something that for us is super important. From the other side of it, when we're saying what's, how do you know when you're not supposed to do something? It's trust your gut. I mean, like, it, it's crazy how, like how many conversations I have with artists where like, I shouldn't have done that thing, but I did it anyway. And now I feel like the com competition for that brand, I can't ever work with them. Or, you know, I, to Andreas's point, I didn't take as much money as I should have. Um, but yeah, it's a lot about gut and you feel it as an artist. And I, and I believe artists have like such an internal like connection to intuition um, and it's their baby, like their cap is their baby and it truly needs to be protected at all costs. Um, and as a brand, like I, as a person who represents the brands, I want to make sure that that is protected. And, and there are people who will take advantage of artists and then again, not pay them, which is real crummy guys. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, no, I think that like the payment thing is important or if it's not payment, what else are they providing you? Maybe it's exposure through, through PR um, through PR experiences or opportunities, because the, that exposure ideally will uh, open up more doors. But again, it's, it's trust your gut and it's, it's look at the opportunity. Um, and, then, and what's your, like, what are your goals, I guess, too? Uh, I think that's important. Like, if you want to work with Nike one day, you know, think about who their competitors are. You might not be, maybe if it's like, not that this is a thing, but like, you think about brands and think about their competitors and think about like, if you're going to put content out there that's in direct competition to something, maybe that could be a, a red flag for a brand when they look at you. Right. Okay. Um, I super appreciate the perspective from the brand. Um, just for folks who are like 
listening in on this gold that Abby has. I've got a couple more questions for her later on in the panel that are specific about relationships between uh, brands uh, and artists. Uh, so, so more of that to come. Um, let me put it to Ricky. Ricky, what, what would you say in terms of, yes, picking, curating things that are right for your career and when to say no? Um, just to acknowledge both Abby and Andrea's answers, a lot of great points there. Um, in terms of just adding perspective, I would say first and foremost, it's about uh, self-awareness, both in terms of what you're good at, um, because any opportunity you take should reflect your, your strengths and not stuff that you're still trying to discover. Um, for example, if you're a studio artist and require auto-tune, a great mix, certain vibe, uh, a room full of people to create that, and then you have an opportunity to do an acoustic set live to air, um, maybe that's not the opportunity you take on because you're not that good at that style of singing. Um, so make sure you, you're curating opportunities that reflect your strengths um, and your brand. Uh, make sure it's in line with what audience is going to be the viewer for this, the natural audience, because what you want to do is engage or capitalize on uh, the audience that you're in front of, not the audience that you're bringing to the opportunity, because those are your fans. Those are people that are going to tune into your stuff. What you really want to do from opportunities is capture other fans, new viewers, people to um, get to know you and get to know your material. So strength based is super important and making sure that's in line with your brands and near goals in terms of stepping stones and what you want to get in front of. Um, just in terms of pay, uh, money is important, but I know for emerging artists and I've worked with emerging artists and I've been an emerging um, professional in this space, it's not always about money. And what I mean by that is it's about value and what value does the opportunity bring to you. Um, and sometimes it's not monetary. Monetary is the exchange for money. But right now in a lot of your careers, you might not need money or money not, might not be the opportunity for what you have to offer. It might be getting you in certain rooms. It might be getting you in front of certain audiences. It might be giving you a experience that can live on your CV or your resume that's going to open another door. It might give you a platform to try something um, that's real, feels real, but is the ability to do it without taking that risk of getting paid and maybe failing. So it's looking at what the exchange of value is. If we all get to a point where it's really about money and it's about making sure your, your, your value is reflected in that dollar, that's incredible. That's the end result. But until then, it's what other stuff comes along the way that makes sense for you. Um, and, and again, that's self-awareness and making sure that you're asking the right questions, you have the right people around you, you're, you're having conversations with people that want to see you do well and can shed light on those things. And then you ultimately make the, the, the right decision for you, making sure that you, you excel and, and kill any opportunity that's in front of you. I love what you said about the idea that you should accept opportunities that reflect and shine a light on your strengths. Um, I think that's such a good, like, because it's going to be natural, like, for any artist who accepts an opportunity, you know, if you're super anxious or super worried about one part of it, for there's a reason. You know, maybe you've accepted something that where you're like, you know, I really got to work on my whatever it may be. I got to work on my, on, my, on my ability to speak or I got to work on my live performance. I got to work on my intonation, whatever it may be. And to take those, take that anxiety as a cue where it's like, okay, this is not a strength. I got to work on it so that it becomes a strength. But in the meantime, you know, to make sure that you're taking things that really highlight what you're good at. I think that's such savvy advice. And, and you know what it is too? It's, it's about learning how to say no, because an opportunity might not make sense right now. Um, and that's something you might know, but you'd want to do it later um, down the line. So it's about making a real effort in communicating why you're not going to take it or saying no in the right way, because yeah. that's more important than taking every opportunity. Opportunities are exciting, but the right ones are meaningful. And then other ones might make more sense down the line or might never make sense. But it's about making sure you know which ones and how to communicate yes or no. Um, that's going to be the difference maker. Awesome. That's I have one thing to add. Sorry. I think that, that's a, such a good point, Ricky. Um, I'm never, I'm, I'm not more impressed. Does that make sense? I'm so impressed with artists 
who say no to me. I'm just like, oh, okay. Like, I'm just like, yeah, tell me why. And it's always like a very good reason as to like, it just didn't make sense to them right now for the opportunity, for the for whatever reason, it didn't make sense. I was always like, yes, I respect that so hard. And I actually really, like, and I appreciate that. So I think to your point, saying no provides power and saying no almost like commands respect from people in a way that like, I'm just like, cool, not for this brand, but I'm definitely going to keep you in mind for another because I think, because I know you know who you are. Like, I know you feel like, feel that. So thank you for saying that because I totally forgot. <laughs> thank you. Um, keeping an eye on our time for the questions here. Tony, I'm going to put it to you for a second too. Um, yeah, I think uh, everyone has said great points. Um, Abby, definitely, you really got to go with your gut. It, you, you, you can tell when something is just too good to be true. And um, so a lot of times you really do have to go with your gut. And um, Ricky, I really appreciate that. Back in my day, it was called volunteering. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm, you know, I'm going to volunteer for something. And well, what's the pay? No pay. But, um, but, you know, some of the best opportunities I had came from volunteering. Some of, because it just, you know... At the time, I didn't think about the money. I didn't think about, um, you know, what I was going to get paid at the end of it because I knew there was no money at the end of it. But what did I learn from that uh, particular thing? Uh, you know, wh whether I volunteered for a video shoot or whether I volunteered um, for, for something live or, or an event, uh, it, it definitely helps me and, you know, uh, stepping forward. You know, uh, one of my most nervous interviews was interviewing uh, Maya Angelou. And um, I interviewed her and, um, you know, I said, well, what happens when, you know, something happens and, you know, it doesn't go your way? And she said, when one door closes, <laughs> another one opens. And, you know, I walked it. I mean, it's simple, you know, and I walk with that. And I tell, you know, I tell my kids, I'm like, yeah, okay, whatever, dad, but right now it's closed. Um, but, you know, you, you can't see it. And I think that's one of the biggest things about life. You're not supposed to see it because you're supposed to build up and work to make that door open. You're supposed right. to put in the work. It just doesn't come to you just like that. You know, when, when you put that work in and that door opens, you realize you've got enough, your skill base is ready for you to take on that next challenge. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Planet? Um, yeah, first of all, I love Master, P, Master T's answer. I love that. Yo, T, you are the man. <laughs> I have been watching you since literally like the VJ days in the parking lot. I am so, so happy to be on a panel with you. I just have to say. Thank um, you. Okay. I, I, I got to give you one big ups too. Your lighting is absolutely perfect. You just, oh, just thank you. Thank it's you. just full vision. <laughs> anyway, I appreciate that, bro. <laughs> um, yeah, I just had to say that because, uh, you know, I'll get to the question in one minute. Basically, Master, Master T, you are a legend. And uh, legend in the, in the coolest ways, in the Toronto ways, in the hip-hop scene. Like, to be here with everyone is awesome, and especially you. And to just be here in general, it's very um, inspiring to me as well to have you with us. No, I thank you. But you know, the thing is for me at my age is to be around you that have gleaned, whether it's from once music or whatever, all the doors and what you. you watch, you guys are all bringing it in different, in different ways. And that's what's it. important for me. So I, mm. I thank each, each and every one of you. You're bringing a force that you don't, you, you all re recognize what you've done and what you're doing, but um, it's that base and foundation that, that I'm enjoying right now. So when we're mm -hmm. back, when we're back in business and we can have events, we're going to have a dope unity party. We're going to invite yeah. mass. Everybody coming. Yes. Well, we're allowed to hug again. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Lots of love. So, um, yeah. So just to wrap up the question, basically, I love whatever, what you guys have been saying. And I'm going to tell you right now, when I first started on film music design, I did not say to myself, how am I going to get paid off this right now? I said to myself, how can I build a portfolio so people know that I have something to bring to the table? Um, I was volunteering, like Master T was saying. I was doing stuff for charities where they had an event. I would show up. I would edit something, put something together. They would release it. I was going to live concerts. I know it's a little bit tricky now with no live concerts. But basically, the money will come. You need to understand that money is just a consequence of success. Really, that's just a side thing. The main thing is that you're happy and that you love what you're doing. And if your mind and your heart work together, that's really important. So to answer the question, you don't need money right up front, but you need to have an array of work so you can show someone why you deserve to get paid. And so that's where volunteering and creating a portfolio, that's the most important thing in my opinion. And from there, money just comes in. Love it.
All right, everybody. Um, and I think it's interesting, again, a natural flow. Money is a, yeah, it's a big one. Money is a consequence of success. People are dropping gems. <laughs> yeah, I'm loving it. Um, but I kind of want to keep going with the, kind of with the, um, with the question of finances. Um, entry level and emerging artists, um, you know, A, to, uh, folks are always balancing, you know, we're making money in lots of different ways. One job, two part-time jobs, three part-time jobs, plus, you know, freelancing, plus X, Y, Z. Um, but what you see a lot is there's like, there's this important balance between creating for artistic growth, creating for art for art's sake. But then there's also wanting to be, there is wanting to be paid through your art. But what we see a lot is that artists will invest a huge amount of time and energy into building skills that while they may be important, might not ever have very much revenue earning potential. And just one example of this again, say from like a recording artist, like an entry level or emerging recording artist, for example, it's like making money through your recorded music is like one of the hardest ways to get paid as a recording artist. And yet the amount of time that people spend on that is so disproportionate. Um, so I'm gonna put this question to three folks on the panel specifically. Um, and bearing in mind that we have different art forms represented in the room today. Um, I'm gonna put this question to Andreas, Abby and Ricky. And the question is, um, what kinds of revenue earning opportunities are often overlooked by emerging artists? And how can they invest their time and energy into building skills that will actually get them paid? Ricky, can I throw it to you first? Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, just on the, so coming from a music perspective, uh, on the topic of generating revenue and money, um, I always say don't create for the purpose of making money yet. Um, do it because you love it, because when you will create money is the unknown. Um, so if you're creating for the purpose of making money, you might hit uh, glass ceilings and brick walls and start, start disliking what you loved in the first place. So do it because you love it. Um, do it for the journey. And hopefully amongst the journey, you'll find ways of creating a revenue. Um, and then hopefully amongst uh, creating some revenue, it could be self-sustainable and that's what you're doing as a career. Um, but if it never does, you should always create because you got into it as a passion. Um, and the only way to keep passions alive is to do it because it's a passion, not because of the ulterior motive. And money is usually um, that. So always have a plan B and don't let that uh, end the race for you. But I would say in 2020, especially now because of COVID, COVID was one of the biggest eye openers for the music industry. Um, that being one of the most competitive ways to make music was live, live performances and that stopped. So that brings it right back to even in a world pandemic, you could still generate an income from streaming. Um, and where we are in music in this climate is you don't need a record label. You don't need anything beyond the ability to partner up with uh, organizations like DistroKit, TuneCore, and a host of others that will administer and upload your music given you give them the right parameters and specs, which are all outlined very clearly and they will actually collect your money for you and return it to you. So they will upload your music in every avenue and platform that an audience goes to listen. So whether it's SoundCloud, uh, Apple, Spotify, Pandora, Tidal, um, and, and they all drive a different audience to it, it will, it will generate money. And that's the most overlooked thing because people compare themselves to large level recording artists and you don't need to be signed you don't need to have a huge audience you could be popping in china and no one in north america might might even know you and you're making enough money to to feed your whole family or feed yourself so i think for an emerging artist take the right steps to get your music properly released um and collect your money someone will collect it and give it to you you don't have to do anything else but find what distributor you're going to use follow the guidelines and giving them your music and your artwork and leave the rest up to, to fans and listeners to share it, tell people. And even if it's one view or one listen or a million listens, you'll see the money from that. Awesome. 
that's great advice, Ricky. And then again, just for the folks in the room, if we got any MCs, any singers, songwriters, um, DJs, producers, make sure that you tune into next week's panel as well, because we'll get a little bit more into like where some of that where some of that low hanging money fruit is for those art forms specifically next week in more detail. Um, I'm going to shoot it down to Abby. Um, question again, what kinds of revenue earning opportunities are often overlooked by emerging artists and how can they build skills that will actually get them paid? Again, I think Ricky said a lot of things that I was just going to bounce off of. Um, from the, the standpoint where he said like, do what you, like it was essentially like, do what you love, the money will come. I'm not kidding. Like that is, I've seen so many incredible examples of that in my work. Um, for example, I don't know if anybody knows who Serial Artist is. Um, Serial Artist is a person that basically makes bootleg Nike stuff, um, but like really, really dope stuff like wallet cards, bags, like she'll just, she literally takes apart Nikes and then mashes them up with like uh, uh, clear plasticky stuff and makes stuff out of it. Anyway, I'll put it in the chat. But yeah. Um, we saw her, like, I saw her Instagram when I think she had, like, a thousand followers, and I was like, this girl's dope. She, all she does is this, like, this is her life, like, all she wants to do is make these things, and she didn't really have a store, she kind of was just, like, doing it off the side on IG, so I met up with her, and I was like, listen, like, we love what you're doing, like, yeah, you're doing bootleg like, stuff, but it's dope, like, we love it, so, like, we can't get into an official partnership with you, but we definitely want to support your craft. So we were just sending her like laces, like random things so she can make stuff out of. And through that, um, she was able to like make more stuff. And then now I think her, she's like, she like popped off like Hype Bay, Hype Beast, Sneaker, everything. They all covered her because they're like, all this stuff is so dope. She literally started, she didn't know how to sew. She didn't know how to do anything. She's, she's not even a Canadian citizen. She's like, she's like here on a visa. Like she's like doing the most with like the least <laughs> um anyway so she was like just like such an inspiration and and she is now in a place where like brands are just like going crazy for all her stuff and she's getting you know people are imitating what she's doing and she's now making money and she's now this is her full career and it's all she ever wanted and and yeah. it's what's dope is that she never like faltered from that like that she like knew what she wanted and she just kept going at it um and then you know the cosign from somebody that represented Nike Toronto was all she needed to be like done like well let's go do you know what I mean and like it ended up being such a fun like partnership with her to continue seeing her grow and I will put it in the chat because she is really really dope but um circling back basically you know if you don't love what you do enough to just like I would like for example the charity I have on the side I would go broke in order for that thing to like live and and, and I feel like there is like that and maybe that's bad advice, but like, uh, I care so much about it that I'm willing to learn everything I need to do to do everything I need to do in order for it to succeed. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that's similar to a lot of the artists who come from nothing and they make it like they'll back to the resourcefulness thing. You just need to like, you learn all the things you do. You need to know to, to succeed. Um, and I feel like that comes out in your work. Yeah. hundred percent. I love that. And again, coming back to the idea of like balancing. And I think one thing to just sort of insert here is that it's okay. Like what everybody is saying is if you're not at the stage yet where your art is making you money, there's no shade and no shame yeah. in working multiple jobs until you get the acknowledgement or the respect or the notoriety to be doing what you do. It doesn't make you any less of an artist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make you any less singular or dope or anything like be like, yeah, like we said earlier, you know, you got to respect that hustle and everybody went through that. So let's normalize it. Let's name it. Let's talk about it. <laughs> um, and yeah, to keep that, keep that passion strong. Okay. Andreas, what do you think? Yeah. I mean, I, I think Ricky and Abby made some really, really good points. And I think what you just said there is also completely on point. I mean, you have to go through the struggle. I mean, all of life is a struggle. It doesn't matter what you do, what path you take, but especially as, as an artist or as a creative, it's, it's not going to make money right away because it's not supposed to. You've got to do it because you love it and you've got to do what you do when no one's looking and when the lights are off. I mean, that you just have to keep doing it because that's what you do. 
and the and if you know you you if you're good at what you do, you have to be good. Uh, you're you're going to get success, and it's going to work. And so I think what what Abby said is, is I want to pick up on what she said about partnerships, and then Ricky mentioned this too. And I think like Abby was talking about how she saw one, she saw a serial artist, someone she liked, and then she went out and said, "Listen, how can we support you? How can we work with you?" So it's all really about partnerships. And sometimes those partnerships are going to come from the Abbeys of the world who are going to notice what you do and say, hey, how do we do that? The other way it's going to happen, too, is if you create a strategy to go out and seek out those partnerships as well on your own, right? So you can't just wait for someone to come and notice what you do. You, yeah, you got to knock on doors. Mm-hmm. You've got to go and, and say, listen, this is the value that I, that I bring. This is what I do. And you got to think outside the box. And so I think right now with with uh, opportunities that are available, you just got to look at big trends that are that are happening in society, like like Twitch and the whole video game uh, renaissance that's happening. I mean, how can you get music licensed there? How can you create partnerships with, uh, say, video gamers or say you're, uh, uh, I mean, there, there's you know, nothing comes to my head right now, but there's a lot of different ways I think you can think about partnerships in a way that will build your audience and get your art and get your work and your creativity out there. So sometimes for sure, it's about partnerships will come to you, uh, but you also have to go and seek out partnerships that, that work for you. And to Ricky's point, which I thought was really good, is you know, a lot of, you don't have to compare yourself to a global recording artist or any kind of recording artist or anyone for that matter. And, and what he said about China is completely on point. You know, the, the internet has created this long tail where all you really need is 5,000 worldwide fans to pay you 50 to $100 every year and you're making bank. That's all you need. And so how you put that together, whether that's through streaming, whether that's through partnerships, whether that's through selling physical uh, merch, whether that's through, uh, you know, videos of, of, of dancing or you're creating art, like physical art, that's really what you need. And so you, with the internet, you can distribute your stuff and you can really uh, showcase your art a lot more easily. And you don't need to be this mega global superstar. You can make a very, very comfortable living and no one even knows who you are. Um, you know, yeah, exactly. no, not a lot of people know who you are. For sure, yeah, for yeah. Sure. True. Okay, I cannot believe how the time is flying. I'm enjoying this conversation so much. Um, but we still have, um, there's, I see that there's a couple of questions. I think there's two questions, but I got one more question each for Abby, Andreas, and Ricky. I'm going to keep you, I'm going to keep you to your three minutes on your answers so that we get, <laughs> so that we get to everybody equally. All right, I'm going to start with you, Abby. Um, again, keeping with the kind of strategy, strategy questioning and relating to the brand specifically, I love to see in the last couple of years, I think we've all seen a lot more brands taking interest in entry level and emerging artists, in community, uh, community advocates, um, people who are, you know, voices and leaders within the neighborhoods that they live in. Um, and I think that the best examples of these are like really beautiful, mutually beneficial, beneficial partnerships, like you said. Um, but uh, I'm wondering if you want to add anything more to what you started saying earlier about how does a brand go about looking for emerging and community artists to work with, and how can artists stand out in the online space? Yeah, I think what's interesting is that I, I speak to a lot of like younger artists who are who are wondering how how do they get seen by brands, and a lot of the times it really is like you could be. A lot of what they say essentially is, well, I'm just as good as this person. Cool. Like, great that you're just as good, but what is it that's making you better? What's making you different? And I think that, like, the differentiators are usually come out in storytelling. It usually comes out in giving back to the community. Like, I can't, I will always choose the kid that's like, I don't care if you have, like, two followers or 50,000 followers. If you're a kid who's skill and you, but you have, like, this, like, need to give back to the community, I will always choose you. I don't know if anybody here knows Huzefa from Regent Park, like he's a shooter and his whole story is taking portraits of people in Regent Park because they, that's not something that they have. Like, you know, families don't have their portraits taken in, in, in lower socioeconomic areas. So mm-hmm. he was like, I just stopped people on the streets and I was just taking photos of them. 
that story itself was like, yep, you're like, whatever it is, we're going to help you. We need to help you do this because this is amazing. So we ended up having him host a Nike Toronto like event and he slapped. Like I was like, everybody was like, this kid is amazing. And that just because he had that story and he had this like love for his community that set him apart from photographers that have been doing it for years and have been doing it and have much more followers. Um, because he, there was something that we saw in him, there's a potential. Uh, his name is Huzefa. Uh, I'll put it in the chat. Um, <laughs> but anyway, he was like incredible. And, you know, I think it's about who you are as a person, not just your craft. It's like, it's one big thing. I always say, you know, I have a friend who he's a chef, but he's also a photographer and he's also a graphic designer. And he really wants to be like, you know, he really wants to hone in and, on him and focus on his chef skills. And I was like, what your skill is actually that you're all those three things. I don't know any other chef that can do graphic design and shoot like you can. Wow. And then I don't think he thought about it like that. So you have to almost step back and think about what is my thing that is different than everybody else's. I love that. And going back to that, you said something earlier that I love that brands have a voice through people. Mm -hmm. And so tying that into like the idea of the value of storytellers and how special and unique people's stories are. It's like, you know, again, very empowering. And like, it's not about who else has however many followers or who's so good at what. It's like your story is unique. And how creatively can you share that with the world? I love that. Yeah, for sure. Thank you, Abby. Um, okay, Andreas, this is going to be the shortest legal answer question. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'll keep it short. Don't get to start the answer with, it depends. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. You <laughs> might have to. Um, okay. Uh, a question, um, a, kind of a high-level question about contracts and protecting oneself and protecting one's art. Um, and I'll just give a heads up. We do tend to work with Andreas, like, on a more regular basis to work with artists about more specifics to do with contracts and negotiations. So, you know, stay tuned with us if we don't get to everything here. Um, so in a scenario where an emerging artist is being offered a virtual opportunity, what should artists be looking out for in terms of the function of a contract? How should a contract be protecting the artist in like a virtual space? Well, okay. it's first thing there's always, always have a contract. Always. It doesn't matter if it's on email. You can have a, a written agreement on email. You can have it by a text. Uh, I just, I get really frustrated when I see good people who just get screwed somehow because they don't have an agreement. So that's my number one thing, virtual or not, just always have an agreement in place. It just sets expectations. I think in, in virtual, I think the things that are important in the COVID time is termination rights and, and you know, ways to get out of the contract. Say if, if there's any portion that is live or say you're renting a venue, even if the venue is empty or you're renting a photography studio or a dance studio or anything, because government restrictions can come in at any time and force the venue owner to say, listen, we can't have anybody there or you can't use the space. I think make sure that you build in termination rights. Like what happens if there's another second wave and the government just shuts everything down? What happens to that opportunity? What happens to your payment? Mm -hmm. And the other thing I think is when you're doing online, especially with music and with, with video, if you're putting music in video or you're using other people's content, is just make sure you've got the rights to do that. It's, it's often very overlooked, but when you're, say, you're putting something on YouTube, you're going to need a synchronization license. You're going to need permission to do that. Uh, if you're using... Uh, putting something on Twitch or on on Facebook or Instagram, if say if it's music specifically, you've got to watch out for the terms of service of those particular platforms because they most of them are not licensed for every single use of music or other people's content. Right. You might get your content pulled, and I think when you're agreeing with the uh, with your other your counterpart, whoever that this person who you're working with is. You've got to be very specific about who is responsible for clearing rights, if you have to, who's responsible for paying for clearing those rights, and then also who's responsible if there's an infringement issue, right? 
And from a practical perspective, if you're doing something on, say, Instagram Live that involves music or, or Facebook, you don't want to get that content pulled. And they, they will pull that muse, they will pull that content if it's not licensed at some level. And then everything you've done is created and then, you know, it's kind of for naught, right? Right. So paying um, attention to that is important. Okay, so Andreas, I'm just gonna ask a couple because I know there's gonna be more questions about licensing and permissions. Can you even, um, and again, to the folks in the room, we'll have another session with Andrea soon to get to some more detailed questions about rights and sync and stuff like that. But Andrea, if you wanted to give a couple of keywords for people to look up to start getting a sense of the learning and where they should be going to get permissions, what would you, what would be your research these terms list be? I think you should understand what a, a synchronization license is and where, when and where you need to get a synchronization license. I okay. think that's important. And I think what else is important is you should look up as well, just familiarize yourself with fair use and fair dealing in copyright, because there are exceptions in the Canadian Copyright Act and also in the US where you can use other people's works. You can take, uh, you know, say music and film and mash it up and create different different uh, compilations and things like this. So familiarize yourself with uh, Canadian fair dealing copyright exceptions, like research those things. Beautiful, Andreas, thank you so much. You really, you made that super concise. I appreciate you for it. <laughs> right. Um, okay, last question um, of the night. I'm gonna put it to Ricky and Ricky, this is such, uh, such an important question. Um, people's art, um, it's so hard to make art when you're not okay, when you're not okay in your mind, when your mental health is a challenge. Um, and realistically, with COVID, with all kinds of things happening in terms of race, racial injustice in Canada abroad, the world is throwing social and economic BS at people left, right, and center. Um, and you, you know, um, working alongside um, folks who are marginalized at Remix, um, you've been working with artists at all stages of their careers, and I assume have supported a lot of artists who have overcome significant barriers to then go on to achieve pretty incredible success. So I wanted to put it to you and ask um, if you had any, uh, you know, personal stories or professional stories, um, words of wisdom and insight to encourage artists to help them stay positive and motivated, even though it's like a storm of it left and right at the moment <laughs> yeah yeah um where do i start i think i think something important for people to uh know and remember is the days of having uh to create music in large-scale studios and pay top dollar for big rooms that look like photo shoot ready are done um, not only for emerging artists, but professional artists. Um, artists I work with, one of, one of our favorite things to do is just uh, get a house and build a studio set up inside the house. And it takes no more than a few pieces of equipment and create our own vibe to rock out. Um, some of our favorite music from the biggest artists in the world, they're recording in hotel rooms while they're on the road. So you still see these multi-million dollar studios, but more so for photo shoots and um, content. Uh, and I say that because as an emerging artist, some, some of the biggest barriers we face is finding finances to fund the creation of your music because um, it's not even like rate, prorated per song, it's prorated a lot of times by hour and then by mix and then by master. And before you know it, um, to create in a space where uh, you're getting out your real expression and fulfilling the idea of the music, it takes time. Um, and a lot of times people's pocket don't necessarily match the time it takes for, for them to create their, their content or their music or whatever. So YouTube University is the best outlet for this. They have a lot of answers. I think Planet was mentioning that earlier, but you can literally create inside your own home, a friend's house, a laptop, computer, mic, halo, eyeball. There's things that emulate large-scale studio setups and it can happen in your own bedroom um, so in terms of a financial barrier i'd say like 
peace of mind. You don't need to go spend your last dollar to create the music that you want to share with the world. Just find a cool place and research how to get that same optimal sound. Um, and it's going to be a balance of some equipment. You're going to have to figure out how to get some equipment, but then uh, learning how to use the soft skills and hard skills on engineering. Um, and those are plugins. Those you could literally go step by step on YouTube and figure out how to create or mix your vocals. Um, the second thing I would say in terms of what's happening in the world today and has been happening for a long time is just uh, it, it's top of mind and in a surface in terms of a lot of people's conversations and what's happening, which is incredible to see. Um, speak to people, man. Have your small circle of people that you trust, um, both with your opinions and value their opinions. Because I think one of the things that people uh, don't value enough in society is the ability to speak to people. When you keep conflict, um, situations, feelings, both, both celebratory stuff and suppressed stuff inside of you, it is the worst poison for creativity. Um, music is expression, it's experience, it's everything. But uh, along that journey, you need to find people, get people to speak to. Consultants are uh, the biggest cheat code we have in society and in our life for anything we want to do, and they're free. You just got to figure out who are the right people to keep around you and who to talk to about everything. Um, your creative and life, whether it's job, family, mental health, um, politics, uh, racist injustices, and anything under the sun and victories, um, relationship stuff, talking to people that you trust in a good circle of people that can act as consultants uh, goes a long way and, and we don't value that enough. Um, but that's awesome. Ricky, I really appreciate it. Um, okay, so there's a couple of questions, but I'm going to say that the questions from our eager question answer um, are fairly uh, discipline specific. So um, I'm going to say they're, most of them are sort of recording producer specific. So I recommend coming to next week's panel where we can really get into some of the more details about, you know, how to stand out specifically as someone, you know, on a mic, whether you're a producer, whether you're a, a DJ or an MC or whatever. Um, but uh, in order to, to wrap the panel again quickly, I want to give folks one more time around. Like, I feel like this has been such an uplifting opportunity. We still have 40 folks in the room with us today. Any sort of final words of encouragement um, in terms of standing out online, in terms of, you know, keeping your head in the right, right space? Uh, Master T, you want to you wanna send out some love to the folks in the room before we wrap? Yeah, I'll keep it short. Um... No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I want to make sure we're still yeah, with you. Attack, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I think it's, um, you know, it's very important to, like, for people to take this recording, take this Zoom recording and play it back. And mm -hmm. there's, as, as I've been reading, there's so many gems that have happened uh, throughout here from all the different disciplines, from all the different uh, talents that are here uh, today. And um, so I think that's really important because, you know, to have this, you know, you can't digest it all. Yes, if you can be writing, if you're there writing, you know, on a, on a pad and you know, you're taking it all in. But, you know, listen, because there's a lot of different uh, ways for you as an emerging artist. Like I, I've learned a whole bunch. So I'm sure if you can go back and listen to this, you've definitely learned a whole bunch as well. So it's very important to, uh, to go back and, and, and reflect on what people have been sharing because people are, are these are high priced people. You know what I mean? These are very talented people that are sharing. Uh, yeah, they, they, they are, they are high-priced, expensive people that are sharing uh, their gifts and talents uh, to people, um, to, to everyone out there for uh, Unity Charity for free. And, um, and that's the beauty of this virtual world as well. So right. capture it. Don't let this opportunity uh, move, move, move forward. Amazing. Thank you so much, Tony. Amen. Anybody else got any final words they want to share? Yeah, I'll chime, I'll chime in real quick. Um, first of all, I want to take this time to say thank you to you, Rebecca. Um, Master T, I love what you just said to build off of that. Um, everyone in this group, everyone who's taking the time to just basically talk about their experiences, their understandings. I just want to say thank you to everyone here. And Rebecca, your questions were all so amazing. And, you know, that's a skill in itself, like just asking the right questions. And so we appreciate you. Dope, dope, dope. Thank you. I appreciate that plan. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I think 
I just I want to say, um, you know, Tony, I, I appreciate what you said. I don't know what my value is necessarily, but it's not higher than yours. So it's an honor to be here with you, really. Sure, Tori, man, I'm going to be calling you for great. advice, so you, you, <laughs> you better give me some nice rates, too. So. I'm there. I'm there. there. <laughs> so <laughs> it's really crazy. It's kind of blowing my mind. Uh, Rebecca, thank you also for, for having me and for allowing us to co-sponsor. This has been fantastic. I, I think, look, I mean, that for me, for all the creatives out there who may be watching this, and I have two things to say, I think. I think the first one is COVID is the great equalizer. I think it's, it's stripped down in any business or industry. It doesn't matter, but it's stripped away all the dead wood and exposed all the weaknesses in whatever you're doing in life. It doesn't music. Is, or art is just one of those areas. So it's the great equalizer. There's so much opportunity now for you. And the second thing I'll say is, and take it from someone, you know, I'm a creative, I play music for the last 25, 30 years, you know, I, but I don't do that full time. If this is what you want to do, you want to be a musician, you want to write poetry, you want to dance and you want to be a creative, go and do that. You have one life, go and do it. That's it. Just, just go and make it happen. Just do do what you love. Thanks, Andreas. Abby, any parting parting gifts? Um, yeah, I think that anybody who's on this chat and who, or sorry, who is participating in this Zoom already is doing the right things of trying to learn more. So kudos to everybody who is um, watching this, and kudos to Unity as well for just putting stuff, putting putting these on. I think that like this is so helpful and. And again, like I don't, I've never been in a room with the rest of you. And the fact that I'm in this now is such a, is super special. And, and I'm very, very um, thankful for that. Uh, one thing I would say to just like a last piece of advice is that I don't like that the phrase, it's who you know, like, I think that's, I think it's missing something. I think it's who knows you is more important mm -hmm. um, because I could know Masai Ujiri, but if he doesn't know who I am, then I didn't make a difference in his life and I'm not memorable. Um, there are ways you can be memorable with people, and I believe that is one of the difference makers as well in how you get ahead. And that's all. <laughs> Thank you, Abby. Words of wisdom for sure. Appreciate that. Ricky, any last last gems? Um, more, more grateful to be a part of this conversation. I think um, more than ever, one of, the, one of the things that I've been reassured and continue to hold very high through COVID was um, and is knowledge is power. So being in a conversation with so many uh, talented and like-minded people has been incredible. So thanks for having me. I'm always a student of the game too. So I'm listening, observing, taking points down. Um, and what I would say is treat every day as a new day. I know our life is a series of ups and downs and conflict and resolution. Uh, so don't take what happened yesterday into tomorrow because holding on to the past can only affect the present and can never affect the future. Mm. Deal with the present as a new new day, clean slate, and that's what's going to impact the future. So wake up every morning, set some goals, whether you hit it or not, next day, go back at it again. Um, and that's with everything in life. Uh, adapted to passion, creativity, relationships, family. Um, and, and yeah, that's that's kind of the last gem on I'll leave you with amazing amazing well I'm definitely going to be, be running the recording on this so that I can capture all of the gems that you guys shared um, I want to thank you again thank you to all of the panelists for your insight for your wisdom uh, thank you to all of the attendees for joining us today and 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 loving everybody up in the chat asking your questions appreciate you um, another huge thanks to Aura Huge thanks to TD for supporting not only, only these panels, but the work that we do all year round in uh, artist training and development. Thank you, TD. Um, remember to sign up for the panels every Thursday, same time for the next, next three weeks following for uh, art form specific. Next week, we got beatboxers, DJs, MCs, songwriters. Um, we got a super slick bunch of uh, panelists, so check that. We're going to be pushing that tomorrow. Week after that is for dancers, breakers, street dancers. We've got some super slick dancers and organizers. Last week for our visual artists, we got um, panelists, we got muralists, graph writers, visual artists, curators, uh, all coming together. Um, uh, follow Unity Charity. <laughs> 
unitycharity.com, Unity Charity on Insta. Um, there's going to be a quick survey when you exit this. And much love to everybody. I've had such a good time. Uh, and hopefully we'll catch you all next week. Right. Thank awesome. You. Thank you again. Thank you, you so much. Back there. One love. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.